Viewer discretion is advised. Chapter 7 Cultivation Trevor, Seth, and Eugene were now in the back of a truck. They were not sure what the truck looked like or who was driving it. All they knew is that they were in the back seats and the vehicle was in motion. They could barely make out blurs of light through what seemed like the car windows in front of them. The dark fabric of the hoods, placed over the men's heads, were thin enough to breathe through, but too thick to really make out any detail of their surroundings. They couldn't do anything about it, either. Their hands were tightly bound behind their backs. They were constantly bumping into one another and being jostled up and down as the truck seemed to move quickly over some kind of bumpy terrain. They could hear, from the front seats, the chattering of two men. The conversation they were having was in Russian. Trevor was sure that Eugene sitting to his left and Seth sitting to his right felt the same intense pain that he did as his lower right hind calf was pulsating in agony. The surgery felt like it took forever. Now, embedded in his flesh, was a GPS transmitter. He was sure that it blinked a blue light. After what seemed to be about 15 minutes or so, the truck began to slow. The blurs of light went completely away. Darkness was now enveloping their entire lines of sight. Suddenly the conversation became silent as the engine to the vehicle stopped. They listened 
as the two front doors sounded their squeaky hinges as they began to open. They heard the men get out and began to talk. Their voices, as the conversation progressed, became abruptly muffled upon the slamming of the two front doors. A moment went by while the muted conversation kept taking place. Then, the voices were heard coming closer to the back doors on either side of them. Both doors then opened and Russian orders were barked at Eugene and Seth as they were sitting on the sides. Assuming the Russians were ordering them to vacate the vehicle the two turned out, put their feet down on dirt, and stood up. Trevor slid over and out of the vehicle to his right, following his best friend. He felt a bump on his shoulder and realized it was Eugene who had been escorted around the vehicle to be stood next to the other two prisoners. And just like that, their hoods were removed from their heads. Two Russian soldiers with assault rifles were standing in front of them. They were standing on a dirt driveway that was covered by a dilapidated wooden awning. The awning was attached to a small shack of a house. The three of them noticed the army-style jeep that they were riding in was now directly behind them. It was daylight out, however, quite shady under the awning. The skies were cluttered with storm-like clouds and there was a slightly cold breeze in the air. The Russians began shouting and pushing the three with their weapons, signaling them to go in the Be house. Good, what? Now? Trevor thought to himself. Why don't they just kill us already? The voices got louder as the shoving became more forceful. All right, already. Seth snapped back. Still bound at the hands, behind their backs, they entered the house single file. The door was hanging off the hinges and propped open, so entering was not a problem with their hands tied. As the three entered, they noticed a bare room with two bed frames. Each bed frame had a mattress on it. The mattresses didn't have any sheets or blankets. Instead, nicely folded in the corner of the room, under a large window, were about five or six dusty, tattered blankets. At the back of the room, was a door that was closed, and to the side of them was a small kitchenette with a window that peered into the street. Inside the little kitchen was a stove and a fridge, although certainly not working. One of the soldiers walked over to the kitchen and opened a cabinet. As he spoke to them with sharp Russian words, he opened the cabinet, which was crammed full with various cans and packages of preserved food. He pointed to the closed door across the room, while speaking in Russian once more, gathering his three prisoners' attention. Bavana. Then he pointed to a diagram posted on the fridge with magnets. The diagram appeared to be a layout of the house and a few blocks or so around it. There was a red line drawn around a big portion of neighborhoods that included the house inside of it. The soldier kept saying things in Russian that seemed to signal to the men not to breach the line. As he sternly spoke while moving his finger back and forth across the line, he kept on pointing inside the red line, then out again. Just then, he walked up to his hostages and pointed at Trevor's GPS transmitter as he barked a single word in his native language. At that time, he paused for a moment and looked at each of the confused men. Then he signaled to his partner. One by one, the other soldier cut them loose, while the other one drew his weapon. Then he spoke another single word in Russian, but the three just stared in confusion. The Russian then repeated the same word, only louder, while gesturing to a lead. Trevor sat down, while Eugene and Seth followed his lead. Both of the Russians were now pointing their weapons at them. The one that was just barking orders stepped forward and lowered his weapon. He pulled out a piece of paper and read four words aloud from it in plain English to the three. The words came across with a thick Russian accent and were clumsily spaced out. Oil Kairum to. Open pastor. Then, just like that, he placed the paper back in his pocket, turned and walked out of the house and back to his jeep. His partner followed closely behind while watching the three hostages as he left. As if they were not confused enough, they listened as the car doors opened and closed. Then the engine started up, 
and the sounds of a vehicle backing up met their ears. The jeep sounded as if to stop, then changed gears as it sped away. Eugene got up and rushed to the window. He watched as the vehicle made a right turn and disappeared around a corner. Eugene turned around to Seth and Trevor, who were now also standing, staring at him. What the fuck? Open pasture? What the hell is this place? Where the hell is this place? Where the fuck is my wife? Trevor and Seth started looking around. Seth began looking under the beds and rifling through the blankets. Trevor went over to the closed door and opened it. A waft of stale, foul odor met his nose and made his gag reflexes go into overdrive. I think I know what Vanai means in Russian, Trevor stated, referring to a word recently used by one of their Russian captors. Seth and Eugene looked over at him and into the room behind. What once was a bathroom now appeared to be the centerpiece of some horror movie. The old bathroom had been converted into an outhouse-like compartment. There was a toilet still there, but it sat on a plank of wood, obviously over what used to be plumbing, now most likely replaced by a simple hole in the ground. The human waste, obviously still there from the house's most recent occupants. A grimy, rusted out, old sink was fixed to the wall and barely hanging off. Surprisingly, there were rolls of toilet paper in the corner, stacked next to the toilet. Jesus Christ, for the love of God, close it. Seth cried out. Trevor quickly accommodated the request. Just then they heard what sounded like laughing. They looked over at the thin window behind them, facing the street. At the very bottom left corner, there was a face. But as soon as they laid eyes on it, the face disappeared. The three of them bolted outside, Eugene leading them. A little Hispanic girl, appearing to be about seven or eight years of age, wearing a little white and blue flowing dress, was running away from their house. Eugene was able to catch up with the mini intruder and grabbed her by the arm. As he did, both his friends from behind yelled for him to stop. The little girl, shocked, spun around and fell to the ground, slipping from Eugene's grip. You think this is funny? Eugene asked in a stern voice. The little girl, scared and on the verge of crying, picked herself back up, brushed the dirt off her dress, and proceeded to run across the street to meet up with some of her friends. That's right. Go on. Get out of here. Meanwhile, Seth and Trevor were walking up to him from behind. She's just a little girl, Eugene. Seth said in a gentle voice, trying to calm his friend down and catch his own breath at the same time. Eugene turned to him. We gotta get out of here. We gotta find the others. I need to find Anne. With that, Eugene began to run. Trevor and Seth followed him, begging him to come to his senses. Eugene, stop. We can't go too far. They'll know. Let's go back to the house we can come up with a plan. They could see, as they were chasing their friend, people began to watch as they all just stood in their places, not saying anything. The community of people and the buildings around them spoke of a poor third world country soaked in poverty. Eugene, please, come on brother, we'll figure it out. Just then, they heard beeping from their transmitters. Seth and Trevor stopped in a manner so fast, they had to put their arms out and catch their balance. They looked on in horror as Eugene kept going. They could hear the beeping on his transmitter pick up pace and frequency. Eugene! They each yelled. All of the sudden, Eugene collapsed and looked like he was having a seizure. Except, he wasn't. The transmitter must have an electrical shock mechanism in it for when designated borders are crossed. Trevor immediately began forming a game plan in his head. He could hear a much slower beeping from his and Seth's transmitter. If Eugene just now became too far and triggered the mechanism, maybe they could just walk up, barely to that line, grab their friend, and pull him back over the threshold. Then, he thought to himself, his shoes. 
They were just like rain boots. Completely rubber. Stay behind me. I have an idea. Trevor looked over to Seth and commanded. Trevor got down to his knees and started to crawl toward Eugene, who was violently writhing in electrical pain, about 30 feet ahead, frothing at the mouth. Seth was now down on all fours as well, as he followed his friend. They slowly made their way across the invisible fence lines. The beeping on their transmitters were gradually increasing in frequency, matching the increased frequency of their racing heartbeats. As they neared their friend, they slowed immensely, as the threatening, now exceedingly rapid beeping warned them of a similar fate. Just a little bit further now, Trevor whispered to himself. He began to reach out to Eugene. He could almost touch him. He turned to Seth. As soon as I grab a hold of him, grab my feet and yank us out. Only my feet. He knew that once he grabbed onto Eugene, he would become a conduit, but Seth would be fine, grabbing Trevor's rubber boots. He got to his belly and began to crawl, the beeping on his transmitter now practically matching Eugene's. He reached out his arm again and stretched as far as he possibly could without moving forward any further. Finally, he was able to reach his friend. He slapped his hand, not wanting to be shocked away, and firmly grabbed it. He began convulsing with electrical shock waves racing through his body. Then, almost immediately, he felt the ground slip from under his belly, up and past his face as he was being drugged backwards. Finally, the electrical shock faded from his body, leaving him tense throughout with a fierce taste of copper and blood in his mouth. He let go of Eugene's limp hand, looked up at Seth, who was looking at him in amazement. He gave Seth a thumbs up and threw him a large grin and then swiftly proceeded to pass out. Upon a few seconds of being unconscious, and after being helped up, Trevor and Seth looked over at Eugene, who was still on the ground, seeming to be completely knocked out. The two knelt over their friend, and from either side, they lifted him up from his underarms. They began to make their way back to their new hovel, noticing all the stares they were receiving from their new neighbors. The first night in their new house proved to be very dark, with only two windows on either side of the small one-room home. Only a tiny bit of moonlight crept in. They managed to force the front door closed, even though the upper hinge was completely dismantled. The clouds over the small micromanaged community crisscrossed over the moon, causing the lights in their home to morph from one shape to the next. Trevor took one bed while Seth insisted him and Eugene should have the comfort of at least a mattress for the evening, as he slept between them on a blanket on the floor. Eugene was knocked out from exhaustion on the opposite bed. It was reasonably chilly that night. They had used all the blankets to make themselves their places to sleep. Seth used one in particular to give himself a buffer from the rotting hardwood floors. Seth continued to speak as him and Trevor were whispering their mere muted conversation. And they just stood there, Seth remarked. They were trying to keep their voices down as their friend Eugene recovered. It's the weirdest thing. It's like everyone is just okay with this. They all had transmitters like us, Trevor replied. Who knows where their red lines are? Some of us have to share some of the same areas. We were passing right through groups of people. Seth kept thinking of the weird way everyone was just staring at them. No one coming to their aid. It's just weird here. We gotta figure a way to get out. Trevor rolled to his side and checked on his recovering friend across from him. He saw the blanket slowly heave up and down. Then he looked down at Seth. Once there's more light, I'm sure we'll come up with something. Eventually, the two began to drift off to sleep. Trevor sat up quickly. It was daylight now, as the sun shone through the windows. He looked down and noticed that Seth was not there. He began to stretch as he woke himself up. Then, looking across the room, he saw that Eugene wasn't there either. 
His heart began to race, but his mind told him to stay calm. Everything is probably fine. They're most likely just right outside. Just then, a loud knocking from the door startled him. He sprung to his feet and walked over to it. He saw a blurry, dark figure far off into the distance. His eyes were still adjusting to the bright sun. As he walked out through the covered parking area, he noticed the figure was facing away from him. Slowly, it turned around toward him, and as it did so, he noticed it had Eugene by the throat. Even from the great distance away, he heard Eugene screaming. Trevor sat up quickly again. He was back in bed, and it was no longer daylight. It was pitch dark. It soon dawned on him that he had just awoken from a dream. He looked down at Seth, who was still sleeping on the floor. Then he heard a voice off in the distance. It sounded like Eugene, and it echoed of his dream he had just woken up from. He immediately looked over to the bed across from him. Eugene was gone, and then he realized that the door was open, once again, leaning against the interior wall, clutching on by its bottom hinge. He heard another shout from off in the distance. It was definitely Eugene. Seth, he shouted in a whisper. He didn't know why. He whispered, just habit from being in a dark, sleepy room, having just woken up. Seth, he said again, this time in a louder voice. Seth sat up and turned to Trevor. Trevor gestured to Eugene's bed. Seth looked over and then back at Trevor. This time, they both heard it. Eugene was screaming outside, way off in the distance. They both scrambled to their feet and ran outside where they could hear Eugene more clearly now. As they ran towards his voice, they began to see him come into focus. They slowed down, remembering the event from earlier. They approached him, cautiously listening for their transmitters. Come get me, you stupid motherfuckers, Eugene shouted. They were close enough now, they could hear the beeping from Eugene's leg. They were also close enough to whisper to him. Seth tried to calm their friend, Eugene, come on, let's get out of here. Eugene looked over at the two. I'm gonna wait till those stupid fucking Russians come and get me. Then I'm gonna make them eat their own fucking guns. Then he turned his gaze from his friends back to the wind and continued shouting. Come on, you pussies. Come get some. Trevor noticed car lights off in the distance approaching them. He thought he'd take a shot at convincing his friend to come with them. Come on, Eugene. You know we can figure this out. This isn't the way. Eugene looked at Trevor with sad eyes. Where's Anne? I want my Anne. Trevor sighed and looked at the car lights getting closer. I know. I want my sister back too. And Delilah. And Caleb. But I'm telling you, brother, this isn't the way. Let's get back inside before they get here. Eugene paused. A slow expression of logic washed over his face. Trevor and Seth indulged in a temporary rush of relief as Trevor held out his hand. Come on, man. Let's figure this shit out together. Without them. Again, Trevor gestured to the incoming hazard. Eugene's facial expression changed. His eyes lit up. No. I'm gonna get my wife. Right now, he said to the two of them. He looked up at the approaching headlights, now only about 500 feet away. Over here, you assholes. Trevor and Seth's faces dropped. A jeep came to a slow rolling stop. With headlights flooding the three, they all shielded their eyes, unable to see beyond them. The sound of a car door opening cued Eugene to taunt the Russians even more. Take me to my wife, motherfuckers. Just then, a shot fired from beyond the lights. Eugene fell screaming to the ground, holding his leg. It was a warning shot. Trevor and Seth, unable to assist their friend without escalating the situation, just stood back in shock, both with their hands on their heads in a stressed posture. Eugene was now on his knees, sobbing as two Russian soldiers approached. They were both holding their assault rifles. 
Once they got up to him, one of them grabbed Eugene by the scalp and yanked him up to a standing position. The other soldier walked back to his car. He pulled out a megaphone and began to make an announcement in Russian to the rest of the neighborhood. Trevor and Seth were unsure what was being said, but they had an idea. They noticed everyone come out from their shacks. One by one, they all lined up. It almost appeared as though they had practiced this before. They couldn't see everyone because of how dark it was, but in the close vicinity, there were at least a few dozen people. Men, women, and children. The Russian calmly placed the megaphone back in his Jeep and pulled out a small handgun. He walked up to Eugene, who was crying and begging to see his wife. He slowly raised the gun to Eugene's head and began to look around at the small crowd. He ensured everyone was paying attention. Then, without even saying anything to Eugene or anyone else, he pulled the trigger, letting his gun make a pop that echoed through the community. The bullet went through Eugene's head and out the other end, spraying blood and brain matter across the beaming lights of the soldier's vehicle. The man clutching Eugene's scalp let him go as Eugene's lifeless body promptly crumbled to the cold, sandy ground. The two soldiers looked at Trevor and Seth, who had now dropped to their knees, still clutching their heads in trepidation. Satisfied with the example they made of their friend, they quickly spun around back toward their vehicle and climbed back in. As they drove off, the headlights slowly began to show Trevor and Seth the multitudes of residents watching the drama. They were lined up at their designated red line limits as they then faded out of sight as the car made a full U-turn and headed back from where it had come.